Good morning, Ocean Rangers, and welcome to our Summer Kids Club. My name is Alicia. I'm very excited to be joining you this morning. Now, we have lots of ways that you can participate with our class today. We're going to be talking all about birds today. Specifically, we're going to be talking about penguins and puffins today, which we have on exhibit right here behind me. If you would like to text in questions, you have ideas, you have comments, uh, please go ahead and do so. 562-286-1838. Maybe you're drawing some of our animals that you're observing today. Whatever you would like to do to help um, share that you're participating. If you don't have a chance to text in, don't worry. You can always write down your ideas. You can share them with family members. I even say you can share them with your pets at home, right? Um, if you're watching this after our show is live, you can always email at the address below. Now, we have lots of fun things we're going to be exploring today, Ocean Rangers. We're going to be looking at our friends here, our penguins to start with. Now, our animals here are birds. They're marine birds. What we mean by that is that they live in or around the ocean. And because they're birds, they're not going to spend their life underwater, but they do find their food in the water. So we're going to be exploring a little bit about animals, the special adaptations or things that they have on their body to live in and around this marine habitat, this, this ocean habitat, and a little bit about how they raise their young, and then compare that to our puffin friends who have very similar but slightly different uh, lifestyles. So let's go ahead and let's be good scientists. We're gonna start by making some observations and you can text in these observations too. What do you notice? Now when scientists make observations, they look for those details. What do you see? Do you see any special features on our penguins? Things that might be helping them right now in their home? Do you notice anything that might be different or unusual? What about their behavior or how they act? All of those things, if you went out to study these penguins, you might take your science journal and write down because they might help give you clues. Oh, look at this penguin having a good time um, about our animal. Now, some of the things that I notice is that here in our habitat at the aquarium, this is our live camera, I can see about four of our animals. Can you find them? Yeah, let's see one here, two, three and four of them. One of them's really enjoying our misters that we put up, which I don't blame our penguins because it's pretty warm outside. What do you notice about their home? Hmm, we get a lot of questions about their home. Now, there are 17 different kinds of penguins all around the world. And we're gonna be studying first our Magellanic penguins. These are the penguin colony that we have here. Then I'd like to introduce you to some of the other penguins. Now, out of all of those 17 different kinds of penguins, there are only uh, two that live full time on ice in the Southern hemisphere. Many penguins will visit those icy places during parts of the year, but you'll notice that even some of them don't visit the ice at all. So that would be an example here with one of our Magellanic penguins. If you're like, wait a minute, I thought penguins lived on ice. Ta-da! Here at the aquarium, we really try to uh, create homes for our animals, habitats that are very similar to what they would have in their natural habitat. And because these animals are actually found in uh, South America, they're found a lot of them on a little island called the Falkland Islands. They they have very cold water, so this water is in the 60 degree range, and they like that nice cold water because it has their food. Um, so they cool off in that water, but on land it can actually be pretty warm, similar to what we have here in Southern California. Oh, so we already have some questions coming in. Excellent, I'm glad you're thinking about our, our little feathered friends here. Caden and Thomas wonder, do penguins mate for life? That's a great question. So Oftentimes, penguins will um, find partners, and if those partners are successful at having babies and raising their young, then they often will stay together. And so we'll talk a little bit about um, penguin babies, because that's a really fun story. In fact, we just went through our, what they call a breeding season. So for penguins, you know, 
believe it or not, throughout the entire year, they spend about 70% of their time out in the ocean looking for food. They don't really spend a ton of time out on land. Um, here at the aquarium, it's very convenient for them to come out, so they often love to come out on land because they get food provided for them. But when you're a penguin out there in their natural habitat, you have to do a lot of hunting for your food. But they do come on land to have their babies and to um, molt, and we'll talk about um, that molting as well. So I guess first what we can do is talk a little bit about, um, so Miss Kai, let's talk a little bit about that story of them coming to shore and having their babies, because that was a great question. So here you can see a whole lot of penguins. Now, they're, you can call them a colony. Some people like to call them a waddle because of the way that they move. So if you ever wanted to waddle like a penguin. Uh, so this is a penguin waddle, or kind of scientifically a, a colony of penguins. And they're all coming to shore, and so what will happen is that the male penguins will come onto land and they'll actually track all the way up into, um, into these places right along the sides here where they can dig themselves a little burrow. I know, it's interesting, right? You think, wait a minute, penguins dig? They sure do. They dig little burrows that can be anywhere from a foot to three feet deep. And they dig that all the way into kind of the sand and rock here, move that out of the way and they make it all ready for their mate, so the female. So if they already have a female that they've paired up for, then they get that all nice and ready, and then when the females come onto shore, they call to each other. And our Magellanic penguins have a very interesting call. It sounds kind of like a donkey. So we're gonna go ahead, and Miss Kaya's going to uh, play you the sound here so that you can <laughs> and that's how they find each other. And then you, they usually um, have a little greeting that they do where they open their beaks, they throw their heads back, they're very excited, they often stick their little wings out and they waddle around each other. Hey, how's it going? Hope you had a good time at sea. And then they get ready to uh, build their nest. Here at the aquarium, we give them nesting materials so that they can build their nest. Usually give them uh, palm fronds and maybe we'll go back, uh, Miss Kaya, to our picture, our live cam, to show just a little bit of where what our burrows look like. Um, so yeah, you can kind of get a sense of where all of those penguins. And so here we go. Here is an example. So we have these already built in. So if you ever visited the aquarium or looked at our webcams and went, wait, where are those holes? Yeah, this is where they, um, they would nest. So they choose the nest. And then we leave out a bunch of palm fronds from palm trees and they pull those apart and they waddle into their little burrow and they build their little nest. Um, and sometimes of the year we even have a nest cam. We didn't have any babies this year, but that's okay. You know, our colony is really healthy. Um, so they bring that over. And then let me show you a little bit of what it looks like. We have a little collage of, there we go. So you can see those palm fronds down here and they'll lay one to two eggs. Here we go. And let me, um, as you're making some observations, so you're looking a little closely here, we have some questions that have, that have come in. Uh, Miss Allie, um, can you write that name just a little? Oh, Kancha had asked, thank you. Um, how did we get our penguins? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, we have five that were rescued and um, the other ones come from other zoos and aquariums. Um, part of our network that is a part of our accredited zoos and aquariums, meaning that they have to go through um, a special process to make sure that all of the homes here for our animals are nice and safe. So we call that the um, Association of Zoos and Aquariums. So 
five rescued. So there are some penguins that every once in a while, they get a little uh, taken by currents a little farther from their home. And they had found, um, in South America, they had found a group of them, and five of them end up coming to live here at the aquarium. Um, the reason they weren't put back in the ocean is that they had some medical problems that could be treated at an aquarium. And so they decided to, um, to keep them here so they can have that ongoing medical treatment, but they were deemed what we call un uh, unreleasable. So that means that if we were to just to put them back in the ocean, they, they might not survive. So they have a permanent home here at our aquarium. That's a, that's a really great question. Sinja asked, how do they tell who is their mate? Oh yeah, so we were hearing that call, right? It sounded kind of like a donkey sound, but to them, I'm sure it was like, Frank, you know? <laughs> Ralph, you know, they can, they, they, they hear each other's calls and they have probably, you know, something in the, that call that allows them to identify each other. So, you know, we're just hearing that same kind of call, but to them, it, it probably sounds like an individual, um, an individual bird. Same thing when it goes for the parents and their young. They, they can identify each other. And then Brie asks, uh, why are penguins black and white? Oh, that's a great question. Did you, that's a great observation. Did you notice <laughs> that um, not only are Magellanic, but as we explore some of the other species of penguins, they, um, they are also this color pattern. So for Magellanic penguins, actually, let's continue our story because we're, it has a little bit to do with their color patterns as well. Let's continue to, to see what it looks like once we have an egg here. So the parents lay two, they often raise one. And if that happens here at the aquarium, um, our aquarium team will often raise the other egg just to make sure that they grow up as well. And then once they hatch from their little egg, ta-da, look at this little bundle. It looks like a little stuffed animal, a little Muppet to me. So they're pretty adorable and they have what we call down feathers on them. So although it looks fuzzy like hair, those are actually feathers that are specially designed to help trap air. And what that does, kind of like a jacket, is once you can trap air, so if you think about the clothes you're wearing, it's doing the same thing. Our clothes aren't making us warm, our bodies are making us warm. And heating up layer of air that is trapped in our clothes. Same thing here. We have feathers that allow our bird to trap air and then its body creates heat and then allows the, the animal to stay warm. And the tighter the feathers when it grows up can be, the warmer they, they, um, they are. So for penguins, they actually have quite a few feathers that grow very close together to trap more air so that they can heat that up. And that's really important for our animals as they live in either a habitat that has very cold water, like our Magellanic penguins, or if you're thinking about the penguins that do eventually live on ice, that's a pretty cold home, right? And so you need to have some pretty special feathers. Now these feathers don't uh, last really well in the water. So they're good for one part of their life. But as they grow, they need to grow their adult feathers. Here we go. Thank you, Miss Kaya. By the way, I'm not alone in our, our studio here. Miss Kaya is helping with all of the wonderful images you're seeing. And Miss Allie is helping with all of those questions. And so we have a really, really thick layer of feathers that come in next. So here is an example of three, um, three New chicks, I would say, they look almost like adults, but what they're missing is their adult band that they get here. Now, after they uh, spend a year as a little penguin, they will lose all of their feathers. This happens to all penguins. So after, um, after they have their babies and breeding season, then uh, the adults uh, will lose their feathers in something called a catastrophic molt. Catastrophic usually just means big, right? There's, it's a big deal. Um, and I'll tell you something kind of funny. For our penguins here, you know, when they come onto land, they're not going back out into the ocean very often, um, or they try not to, to eat, especially when they're molting. Because when you're starting to lose your feathers, you're starting to lose the layer that's keeping you warm. And so instead, they eat a whole lot, so much so, that for our penguins at the aquarium that wear these little um, bands around their, 
their wings to help, like they're kind of like name tags. We have to cut those off so that as they grow and they get very chubby, um, those don't squeeze their little wings. So, um, so yeah, they, when the adults do their catastrophic molt, so they lose big clumps of those feathers and then eventually they'll grow in this nice new, uh, this nice new um, bunch of feathers and it has that adult band that you can see here. So this is the adult coloration. So you were asking earlier, Brie, which was a great question, why are they black and white? So I have my little stuffed animal here as well. Ta -da! Oh, thank you, Miss Kaya. So, you know, you can kind of think about it as, you know, as the penguin is swimming around doing its little penguin thing, there might be a predator that wants to eat a penguin. Now, if you're looking down into the ocean from above, it's pretty dark, right? It gets darker because it's harder for sunlight to go down. Uh, and so they end up blending in a little bit with their surroundings. So they have this nice um, set of feathers that is very dark. At the bottom, though, they have this nice light color. It's the same as if you were thinking about um, just the opposite, right? You're swimming underneath and you're looking up and you're like, oh, wait, I'm looking for food. Ooh, it's lighter up there. You may not be able to see the penguin. And it also is confusing sometimes by having these stripes. It helps break up the coloration. So it may not look like um, a particular animal or it might just look like a shadow. So that, those are some great questions. Now, they also lose their feathers because there's a lot of wear and tear as they're coming onto a beach and they're crawling onto rocks. Um, there could be a lot of kind of bouncing and the feathers also help protect the outside of the bird. And those can get worn down uh, over time. Actually, let's go to our document cam, Ms. Kaya, and take a peek at one of those, um, a couple examples of those penguin feathers. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and turn down our contrast here. So it's gonna get a little darker, too dark. All right, we'll see if we can get our, our light on here. We're gonna zoom in, maybe that will help us a little bit. I can change. So this is pretty small and I'll compare it to another e example here. So that's the penguin feather. They have that little tiny piece right here so we're really zoomed in. This piece here is what we're seeing on top. And then this stuff here is really kind of floofy, right? And that helps trap the air. So if you're thinking about like your favorite coat in winter, it might have something squishy on the inside of it um, to kind of like a feather help trap air. So it having all these little pieces helps with that. And it's so light, it's almost flying away just in my, um, just in our view here. Now to compare it to, let's say, another bird, I, ha I happen to have a parrot feather here to compare. You know, a parrot that we have here at the aquarium is even smaller than our penguins, but its feather is much bigger because it's flying. Do penguins fly? No, they don't fly. So they don't need to have feathers that keep them warm and help them fly. They really just need feathers to help keep them warm. So instead of doing lots of different things like a parrot feather would have to do, they just need their feathers to help protect them from, again, getting out of like, let's say the ocean and to also help trap air. So they can have lots of the same kind of feathers instead of lots of different kinds. Isn't this pretty? This is from our lorikeets one of our, our little parrots that we have here at the aquarium. Sinja asks, do some adult penguins adopt babies who can't find their parents? You know, I hadn't heard that personally. Maybe, maybe one of our viewers has heard that. Um, you know, there are cases of animals adopting other animals. It isn't uh, too common in nature because there's not a lot of resources out there for animals. It can be hard enough just to raise your one baby. But, you know, there are some stories of animals that adopt other animals. Yeah. Um, so, uh, thank you, Ms. Kai. We put up that picture of the lorikeet. So, if you saw that there, uh, very different, right? So, an animal uh, that flies. Now, instead of having, again, these flying feathers, they have feathers to keep them warm. They're also much heavier. So, most birds have a really special adaptation. Besides having just 
you know, uh, specialized feathers. They have, most birds have almost hollow bones. If you think about the heavy parts in our body, right? You can feel your arm. Our bone is in there to help um, our muscles to attach to, to give us strength. And we're kind of weighed down a little bit by those bones. Birds, which is really cool, most of them have almost hollow bones. Penguins and other birds that live in the ocean have slightly heavier bones, which is pretty cool. That allows them to dive a little bit deeper. And because they're not flying, they don't have to worry about being too heavy to fly. And so over time, they actually have developed pretty heavy bodies. So they can weigh, uh, our little penguins, which get about two feet, they can weigh up to uh, 14 pounds. Remember I was saying that they can eat a lot right before they lose their, um, before they lose all their feathers and their catastrophic molt each year? Yeah, some of them can gain up to 14 pounds. That's a lot to pack into that little body. <laughs> that's, that's only about two, um, that's about two, just over two feet tall. Now that's a very average size uh, for penguins, but I do want to show you a few different kinds. This is pretty cool. If you get a chance to watch our webcams and see some of our birds diving, um, you'll see not only them using that, that very football-shaped body to help them really glide through the water, that fusiform, as we call it, football shape. You'll see them kicking with those really webbed feet. And you'll see those really paddle-like wings as they glide. You'll even see little bubbles escape, um, which really shows you, there we go, bubbles! What are those bubbles? Well, remember we said they trapped air? Yeah, it's kind of like a little science experiment. You can see the air that they've trapped in those feathers. By the way, having a new set of feathers also makes sure that you can trap as much air as possible. If the feathers get worn down, it makes it a little harder. Oh, Miss Allie has just, um, brought up a nice fun fact for us to help answer the last question here. Study shows at least uh, st a study shows at least king and emperor penguins have been observed adopting. Oh, <gasps> cute! And boy, are they big babies to adopt. <laughs> now, some of you may actually be close to the size of our our king and emperor penguins. So the emperor penguins can get up to 90 to 100 pounds. Crazy! So ocean rangers, you know, we all come in different sizes, but that is a big bird. That is a really big bird. That's a heavy bird. And, uh, you know, they can get three to four feet tall, which is huge. So I'm five and a half feet tall. Um, I would love in my lifetime to go actually see them in their natural habitat. Uh, we have some statues here at the aquarium that you can waddle up to and measure yourself against um, the, the emperor penguins, but I think they're pretty incredible. Oh, uh, Concha asks, what do emperor penguins do for fun? Actually, this picture is great. Do you see how this one is laying down in the back? And there's one over here. Sometimes they will actually slide. They get under their bellies and they slide. I, it looks fun. I'm not sure if they have it as a hobby, but it sure does look fun. They dance. Yep, yep. Anybody else like dancing? Yeah. So remember we said that they dance to show off? Well, they also have, this is the king penguin, they also have these really beautiful colors to help show off. This helped them impress their mates saying, I am super healthy. I know how to catch fish and it makes my feathers nice and healthy, and I know how to dance. So putting on your best, <laughs> your best suit and dancing and having a good singing voice are all things that uh, penguins love. Uh, Ethan asks, are penguins' feathers soft? <gasps> Ethan, yes, at the very base. Now, you know, I can talk forever and ever about penguins, but we haven't mentioned our poor little friends, the puffins. I know, we have five, we have five minutes. Okay, Miss, Miss Kaya, I can go on and on. But you know what? There are some similarities and differences. Let's go ahead really quickly, though, and look at that map just to show everyone um, because I said there are 17 different kinds of penguins. So if we were to flatten the Earth out and take a look, where you see the blue here on our planet, so this is our, our equator, right? It's kind of the middle part of the Earth. You're going to find most of our penguins in the southern hemisphere down here. When we take a look at our puffins, 
There are three different kinds of puffins out there. They live in the northern hemisphere. So you're going to find them uh, in places like the Arctic and even actually right over here. So some of them have been seen in Southern California, like the horned puffin. So we'll take a peek. But most of the time, they're around like the Aleutian Islands, which are right here, which are absolutely uh, beautiful and cold. They have these really dramatic landscapes. So they have these rocky cliff faces. And very similar to our penguins, they have these specialized beaks. And you, what else do you notice about their bodies? What else is similar? A lot of people get pu uh, penguins and puffins confused. You may have me say them interchangeably. <laughs> I'm going to try to call them puffins, though. It's hard. Um, so they're both these marine birds. And they do have some similarities. Uh, one of the big differences, though, oh, thank you, Miss Kaya. Here's an example of that horned puffin, because they have this really fancy feather right here that sticks right up. It's not really a horn as in it's hard, but it does kind of look like a little extra piece on them. So what is the same and what's different in comparing these two animals? This is, I think, a little Adelie penguin. They look like a cartoon character to me. They're, they're so adorable. I think what, what it is, this little eyepiece here. And I believe some of these, so some of these feathers are, again, not just to camouflage, which is blending in, right, ocean rangers, but to show off, to, to make sure that when they find their mate, they, they're showing that they're nice and healthy birds. So the Adeli penguin has this nice little strip around its eye, like, hello, hello, see me. Well, you probably notice, again, that, that black and white pattern for that counter shading as we were talking about. You might have noticed the webbed feet that they both have, which is really important as they move around some of these cold areas. Now, our puffins, though, they don't generally live right on top of the ice. And that's not true either for, for most of our penguins. Um, but you really won't find the puffins living on, on those icy places. They mostly live on those cliff faces or out in the open ocean. And this is also where they'll find their home. So they will, very similarly to our, our friends, the penguins, they will dig a little burrow to have their eggs. And their eggs are actually really big. So they're so big that instead of sitting on top of them, a lot of them will actually kind of hover over the top of them. And that just uh, makes sure that those babies are as big as possible. So in four to six weeks, as soon as they're ready, they can actually glide off the side of the cliff right into the ocean and they have to start their little baby puffin lives. Um, that's, of course, after they have their, what they call a fledging, which is they've grown in some of their adult feathers. Very similar to penguins, they do find a mate sometimes for life if they're successful at um, having and raising their babies. So they're pretty cool. So this is an example of that horned puffin. I wanted to show you another type of puffin called a tufted puffin. And they, to me, it looks like they're wearing a turtleneck. Have you ever heard of a turtleneck? It's one of those shirts that come all the way up you can wear in the winter. That's how I kind of remember. And it looks like they have this blonde hair. Again, these are feathers. They're not hair. They're not mammals. But to me, it kind of looks funny like that. It's how I remember that this is a tufted puffin, like it's a little ponytail in the back and a nice turtleneck. Oh, so some observations coming in from uh, Shinja says, uh, puffins and penguins are both black and white. Good observation. Do penguins eat veggies or just fish and seafood? That's an, an, another act question. So both puffins and penguins are carnivores. So they're mainly eating meat um, instead of veggies. And that can, depending on the type of puffin and depending on the type of penguin, that can range from little tiny shrimp-like animals called krill. And I can show you kind of what that. So inside here we have an example, these little shrimp that they can grab. Um, puffins are known to grab little schooling fish. Thank you, Miss Kaya. This is an Atlantic puffin that, and they've been known to put in their beaks over 20 of these little fish at a time. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I think that's amazing. Uh, there are some penguins that um, eat squid. Same thing with puffins. So a lot of those small schooling fish, 
shrimp, and um, little invertebrates like squid that they can find in their habitat. I think this is absolutely incredible to be able to fit all of those fish. So that's usually if they're hunting for their babies. And Bella notices a colorful beak. Oh, yes, it's beautiful. So this, um, again, is something to help show off to say, I am super healthy. You should choose me to have your babies with. And then Brie asked, what is the stripe near the puffin's eye? Yeah, so that little, um, you, there's a tiny one here for the Atlantic, but the horned puffin had this nice little stripe. And this, well, it could have two things that it does. It could help um, show off to their mate um, because it has this nice, especially since it's on this nice um, white background, it really sticks out. Or it can confuse a predator because it's hiding their eyes a little bit. It could be one of those two reasons that you would see any kind of markings around an animal's eye. Fish actually do this quite often where they have stripes near their eyes. Thomas asked, are puffins endangered? You know, I'm actually not sure. Um, I think most puffin populations are doing okay, but um, there are quite a few that could be impacted from things like overfishing. Same with our penguins. So overfishing is when we take too much from the ocean and that might make it hard for animals like puffins to find their food. And so making sure that we are fishing from the ocean in ways that what we call are sustainable or make sure that there's future fish is really important for both pu puffins and penguins. Thank you, Thomas, for asking that. Oh, the Atlantic, thank you, Miss Ali. Atlantic puffin is considered vulnerable. So vulnerable isn't endangered yet. That means there's still time to make some positive change, but it does mean that there are things that could impact this colony of, of animals, this, this population of animals. So here's the Atlantic puffin. And you can see they eat these small schooling fish. So if we overfish their food, it'll make it hard for them to find babies. Well, thank you. We went through a lot of puffin and penguin um, fun facts here, ocean rangers. You had some really good questions. You had some excellent observations. I hope you had fun today. Now, if, um, if you're interested, I would encourage you to do our birds activity sheet. You can find that right under the uh, YouTube posting on our website for our Summer Kids Club. We have lots of programming planned all through the week for our 11 o'clock classes. Thank you, Ocean Rangers, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.